This is a large road junction close to Barnsley Town Centre, which carries much traffic, especially at rush hour. But a short distance from this busy road junction, with all its noise and bustle, lies a large area of peace and tranquillity, which is a haven for wildlife. This is the Dern Valley Country Park, one of Barnsley's nature conservation areas, with the River Dern running through it. Yet this was once Barnsley's historic industrial heartland, with areas of mines, railways, canals, and factories clustered around Old Mill and Hoyle Mill. From Harbour Hill, the park follows the River Dern, through Hoyle Mill and past the ruins of the medieval Monk Breton Priory, to the Transpennine Trail Viaduct at Lundwood. In these two miles, much of Barnsley's industrial history unfolded, though very little remains on the ground of its former existence at all. Coal, canals, and railways all played a part in Barnsley's growth in the late 19th century. The process had begun in the previous century with the Industrial Revolution and the enterprise and optimism that then prevailed. This led to two canals being built, the Barnsley Canal to Wakefield and the Dern and Duff Canal to Swinton. The canal at the Dern Valley Park is now disused, but at one time 70 barges a week would pass through, loaded with coal, iron, corn, limestone, timber and other cargoes, but coal was by far the biggest cargo. Barnsley Canal followed the side of the valley high above the River Dern, then turned sharply to cross the valley. At the bend stood the Lengthman's house, the remains of which can still be seen. A Lengthman was a person who kept a length of canal neat and tidy and also looked after the locks and towpaths. The canal crossed the river via a magnificent aqueduct, one of the outstanding features of the whole canal. But nothing now remains except the piers that held the footbridge and some stones left when the aqueduct was... Well, actually, blown up in 1954. The Barnsley Canal's route, now a footpath, can be followed on the other side of the valley, through Cliff Wood and Undercliff Road, which now, by the way, is called Rotherham Road. From there it went north, and it also was closed in 1954. The Dern and Duff Canal met the Barnsley Canal at the Lengthman's house. From there it made its way east. Its winding course was probably planned to serve the mills that were working there when the canal was approved in 1792. On the ground hardly anything remains. The canal bed is overgrown and the ruins of the lock can be seen. But the lock keeper's house has disappeared completely. The two canals played a vital part in Barnsley's growth, opening up new markets for its coal and other products. Their period of great profitability was short, but their impact was lasting. The canal era was quickly followed by another watershed in economic and social history, the coming of the railway, with dramatic effect on the coal industry. Railways meant that the coal could be sent quickly anywhere in the country. Steam was driving an increase in the national economy and coal production expanded ninefold between 1839 and 1913. This transformed Barnsley and the Dern Valley tremendously. It seems unbelievable now, but one colliery railway ran through the middle of what is now the Dern Valley Park.
then north to Nostal near Wakefield, connecting with collieries on the way. It was opened in 1870. One of the most eye-catching features of the valley was the Oaks Viaduct, which carried Midland Railway's Cuddeth branch line. It also gave access to Barnsley Main and Monk Breton Collieries, and was the longest railway bridge in the country. But nothing remains now, unless you look carefully in Oaks Lane, where there are railway tracks still visible in the road. They are a remnant of a line that led to the viaduct and have not been covered over. In the riverbed some large hewn stone blocks are visible, but they seem to be out of place. Above, on the valley side, other similar blocks can be seen. High on one side of the valley, a massive shape looms out of the trees. This and the stones below once formed part of the viaduct. Railways became a major industry in themselves, affecting nearly all parts of the economy in some way or another. Not only did they transport vast quantities of the Dern Valley's coal, their locomotives burned vast quantities of it doing so. Most of the lines are now abandoned but not unused. These days they provide routes for walkers on the Transpennine Trail and other footpaths. Another industry linked to the canal system was glassmaking. Four companies set up in this part of the valley between 1862 and 1872. Wood Brothers at Hoyle Mill specialised in fine cut glass and scientific glassware. The company received an award in 1851 at the Great Exhibition for its exquisite ruby tableware. Redfern Brothers at Old Mill, Ryland Hope Glassworks and Oaks Glass Bottle at Hoyle Mill were innovative glass bottle and jar makers. In 1891, Dan Rylands held 94 glassmaking patents and the Dern Valley's glassmaking industry had a worldwide reputation. Glass companies bought canal side locations because of the bulky raw materials they used. Sand was imported from Holland and Belgium, shipped to Hull, then moved to Barnsley by barge. In this 1920s photo, sand is being unloaded into Woods Brothers' 3,000 ton sand bay. Only Beats and Clark, based in Rotherham, and Redfern survive. Redfern's, now owned by the Ardach Group, has moved to larger premises at Monk Breton. Redfern's sand now arrives by special train using an otherwise disused line. Canals, railways, coal and industry brought prosperity and employment, but they also transformed the Dern Valley into one of the most polluted landscapes in the country. However, since the height of the coal industry, another equally remarkable change has taken place. From this to this. The River Dern was virtually dead in 1980. Now it supports fish once more and is ecologically viable. The valley bottom was marshy. Now it contains an attractive fishing lake and footpaths. Spoil heaps dominated the horizon. Now there are trees and the landscape is green and fertile. These dramatic changes did not just happen. They resulted from work by Barnsley Council and the South Yorkshire Council, which was later abolished. They set up a joint team in the 1980s to transform the area. John Sanderson was formerly an executive director of Barnsley Council. I asked him what the Dern Valley was like at that time. I expected that it was pretty run down. Absolutely run down. The first image I've got of it was 1966 when I was a student. I used to travel uh, through Barnsley uh, going to Coventry from Leeds. And that was before the M1 was finished so you were going on various routes. And I remember going on the Rotherham Road which overlooks the valley and it was absolutely horrendous. 
Um, you had derelict um, old mines, uh, pit heaps, uh, old glass factories, glass colic tips. Uh, there was even a maggot farm there operating and the smell was absolutely horrendous at and times. And to top it all, a, 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 a huge scrapyard too. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and old leather works and so forth. So, I mean, it was in a pitiful state. Mm. And, you know, looking back 800 years, I mean, it was beautiful woodland. It was managed by the former priory at Monk Breton. Um, and they actually started digging coal and so forth, but it would be on a, a small measure, but it would be full of wildlife in those days. But when I saw it in 1966, you know, it was just totally bereft of any uh, life and the, the river was absolutely dead. How did the idea of the country park take shape? Was anyone in particular responsible for the concept or was it a team effort? It seems to be a very big step to move from the area as it was to a space that everyone could enjoy. Well, it was very much a team effort. I mean, it, it stemmed from a whole host of people being concerned about the uh, derelict environment. First of all, the County Council were doing a structure plan. They were formed in 1974 and they were doing a plan for the whole of South Yorkshire. And they picked out this area running through Barnsley and to the east and they called it the East Barnsley Recreation Area at that time because they saw the potential. And then the Borough Council came along and worked in conjunction uh, with them uh, to look at the planning of the area. And then it was included in the Barnsley Urban Area Local Plan as a proposal for recreation. So then it was a matter of working together and using all the resources we could, all the skills we'd got, First of all, from the members down, because the members were reflecting, you know, local people saying, can't we do something about this? And then turning to the officers and saying, well, how can we do it? Well, the officers were, were a skilled bunch, uh, could put together schemes, uh, engineering schemes on how to reclaim areas, how to deal with the rivers, how to deal with the, uh, the drainage, etc. Mm. and come up to come up with the proposal for greening what was this rather black and derelict area. Uh, I'd like to pick you up on what you were saying about resources. Uh, you were a bit stretched. Did you receive any help from the government or any other body? Yeah, there were two aspects because they, it was a national problem. I did, people may remember in 1966 there was the Abavan disaster where a, a pit heap slid down on Abavan, a village in South Wales, killing 116 kids and 28 adults. And, and that stirred real concern about these environmental issues, first of all in terms of health and safety, so there were a lot of health and safety a sort of accident waiting to happen absolutely yeah. and that was all over the country i mean it was the same in barnsley and all sorts of coal areas um and that led eventually to the derelict land grant being available 1982 and that was a tremendous thing for areas like barnsley because they could get a hundred percent grant from government we obviously had to make a case we'd got to put schemes forward and so forth but it meant we could get major grants major funding um, to put with the local authority resources uh, to reclaim these areas. So that was a major feature. But there were also other measures. Urban program had started in 68, very much as a social measure. But in 78, it was changed to economic and environmental. So that could be used. Um, and I think I've, I've got to stress the importance of Barnsley as a local authority and personalities in Barnsley. The leader of Barnsley in the mid-80s uh, mid was Hedley Salt, and he put forward with John Edwards, the chief exec, the idea of all the local authorities who had coal, coal mining areas in them working together as the Coal Communities Campaign. And they campaigned uh, against national government to say, look, we, in Scotland, in Tyneside, in South Wales, in Barnsley, in Lancashire, in Kent, with former mining areas and we need assistance with dealing with these derelict problems. Um, and therefore they got more grant aid put into the areas. And then 
we went into Europe, or they, they went into Europe, and worked with former coal fields in France, in Germany, in Belgium, in Spain, all suffering from the same sort of um, problems of poor employment, poor environment, um, and formed the Reach Our programme. And the Reach Our programme enabled more money, this time European money, to pile into Barnsley and particularly into the Dern Valley Park area. I've only been familiar with all the areas uh, since we started making this film, so yeah. it's new to me. And I think, I think one of the things that really transformed the area is the lake. What a yeah. clever idea that was. How did it come about and were there any sort of first thinkings? Hang on, are we making a rope to hang ourselves if it's water and the kids get into it? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. what, what, what was the sort of thinking making it from, you know, making it to an idea to, yes, that's what we're going to do? Yeah, well, I mean, there was water running through, there's the Dern running through the area and there were various other waterways running in there. There's the old Barnsley Canal, which is was in a pretty uh, desperate state but water is so attractive to people I mean it's attractive you know we all go to the seaside etc we go to the Lake District and so forth and having a lake to walk around to play around and also it attracts wildlife and particularly in Barnsley fishing was very very popular uh, as an everyday mm. sport and so it could it could meet a number of needs and we had the technical expertise to create the lake so it was a no-brainer really to go for that not to do it no. um yeah. and I, I think it's really one of the most successful elements of it you know in yep. terms of serving fisher people and fishermen and, and so on nearly 40 years later the valley has a variety of habitats and a rich diversity of wildlife Cliff Wood runs along the steep-sided northern edge of the valley. It is a mixed deciduous woodland, mainly of oak and birch, but there are also patches of wet woodland on the poorly drained soil with alder, willow, ferns, lichens and mosses. Parts of it have been thinned out to let the light in and improve biodiversity. Sycamore, Beach and oak on the valley floor provide habitats for birds and insects, caterpillars and worms, with some lovely sitting areas for the public to enjoy while they observe the wildlife. I next spoke to Peter Coles, secretary of a local Barnsley Angling Club. The club is sponsored by Barnsley Metropolitan Borough Council to manage the lake and the fishing immunity. I asked him, what work was required to keep the lake healthy? Well, we, we, we just all club together, we all work together, we all do what we can together to keep everything working okay and uh, keep everybody happy with what we do. We just, uh, we just carry on as, uh, as a normal fishing club. Looking round here as we've been filming, I see there's quite a lot of people that are actually angling. So it must be a fairly big club that you've got. We do a concession, which i.e. is if you've got a, a, a blue badge, or if you're disabled, or if you're over a certain age, we, we charge you a concession weight. A day ticket is two pound. You can't grumble at that, no. can you? Uh, ordinary ticket, uh, and if the juniors, if they're under 12, we don't charge them, but they cannot fish unless they've got a, a responsible person with them. Mm. Because if all happens to them, it's a case of who'd have thought it. Is it natural for fish to be here, or do you have to keep restocking it? With that, we, we do a restocking programme every year if we can, if, if uh, we need to, or when we need to. Mm. Uh, what, here's a good head of stock in there. What, what's common in here? Carp. Bream, tench, chub, roach, birch, pike, cruising carp, there's everything. Yeah. Anything invasive? Yes, we've got, uh, we have had a couple of signal crayfish, what we've caught. Just can't keep them down because they, they breed that fast. Fast, yeah. Uh, and, uh, we've been very fortunate yeah. that we haven't had a lot in. Well, but then, I hope nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, what, what, what of the future, mate? Well, 
we're hoping to continue as long as we can and when I've had enough I'll pass reins on to somebody else and hopefully they carry on uh, what we've been established and what we've tried to do for the last few years and hopefully that they'll carry on well, uh, when we're not uh, yes. able to go on. Did you see that? Kingfishers are back on the Dern River though you don't often catch a glimpse of them. The park is a haven for birds. Among its resident species are blackbirds, missile and song thrushes, greater spotted woodpeckers, great tits, blue tits, chaffinches, and grey wagtails by the water's edge, searching for insects. While on the ponds, Canada geese, mallards, coots, and moorhens have become a permanent part of the landscape. And there are plenty of summer visitors too. Willow warblers from South Africa and blackcaps from northeastern Europe. Biodiversity is beginning to play an important part in school education in Barnsley. Here's an interesting story. A teacher gave her class a project, asking them to design a living space that provides good shelter and is built to last, is powered by solar energy, gets its water supply from the atmosphere and underground, provides food for itself and others, is partly underground and doesn't pollute the environment. She also asked them to use their imagination, so they did. Here's a drawing based on the ideas brought forward by the children. Notice the attention to detail, the solar panels, the water pump, the clean greens and happy veg shop and the rumpus room which creates extra electricity. That's very good, said the teacher, but did you ever think of this? Of course, nobody had. We're still learning to think in that way, perhaps. But trees are marvellous, they clean the air, make four times as much oxygen as they need and by removing carbon from the air they combat global warming. Take this tree for instance, here in the park. At the base old leaves are broken down by the tiny organisms, wood lice and worms, releasing nutrients to help the tree grow. The trunk provides food and shelter for insects and caterpillars, which in turn feed birds. The canopy provides shelter for birds, pollen for bees when in blossom, moths lay their eggs on the leaves and birds feed on the larva. One mature oak tree can support over 500 different species of wildlife. Amazing, isn't it? Well, we move on and we hear from Russell Boland, who is Barnsley Council's countryside officer. He's responsible for managing the park. I asked him first how Barnsley Council managed to maintain the Dern Valley Park in the light of the current financial climate. Well, we've had to work um, smarter uh, rather than harder. Um, so, for example, we've spent quite a lot of uh, Section 106 money from developments uh, within the area on many, making the management easier. Um, for instance, we've taken out old ornamental shrub beds and grassed them over. How important for the park is the support from organisations such as Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and the local angling club even? Um, this support is very, uh, very important. <clears throat> uh, these two organisations carry out a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance. Um, they are also our eyes and ears um, on the ground and when we can't be on site every day. Are there any additional ways in which, the, well, us, the folk that come and enjoy this could help preserve and develop Dern Valley Park. Yes, uh, all we ask is that the public enjoy the park responsibly um, by taking the litter home, 
or using the uh, the bins provided, uh, picking up after the dog, um, and by not to having many barbecues or lighting fires. So finally, then, uh, how important will the preservation of green spaces and the natural habitats of wildlife be for the future of Barnsley? Uh, very important, um, as councils are under increasing pressure to develop. <coughs> places like Dern Valley Park become even more valuable um, as wildlife refuges and also places for recreation, uh, benefiting people's mental and physical well-being. Remembering what Russell Boland has just said, meet Sophie Pinder and Lucy Brown from Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. They're working to improve the environment here in the valley and also at other sites. Uh, so things like habitat maintenance to ensure it stays in good condition, things like scrub clearance uh, on flower meadows to stop the, the flowers from being encroached on, um, river cleanups, removing invasive species, but also day-to-day -day maintenance of the site. So footpath works, fence repairs um, and litter picks as well are all regular jobs that we do. So, without putting too fine a point of it, not a gentle stroll in the park? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. no. <laughs> so, no, it's quite a lot of work for just a couple of people to do. Uh, sometimes we require extra skills. Um, so, things like having chainsaw licence, brush cutter, that sort of thing. It's, but a lot of the things we do are, are things that anyone can get involved in. Which leads on to uh, the next point, it's a big area, uh, you've got the river, you've got reed pond, you've got a fishing lake, grassland and woodland. Uh, who works with you to help carry out your management? So Barnsley Council do help a lot with us, so as you can see here we're on some amenity grassland that gets cut quite often, so they'll come in and park some countryside service and um, cut it for us. We also have the fishing lake just up here, um, where there's some local fishermen always clear it up for us, like do a little litter pick around the area, and there's also um, a company who works with as a council named Twigs who also help out whenever they're needed so it's quite a team effort really going on. Um, we've just broached on the subject of volunteers <laughs> already yep. uh, but how important are they for this maintenance job yeah. and what sort of skills do you need? So volunteers are really important Yorkshire Wildlife Trust is a charity um, and we do manage a lot of nature reserves as part of uh, our charitable aims so volunteers are really really important um, as I've said we don't always need skills necessarily because we can train them on the job get them to learn how to use tools um, and that sort of thing the main thing we want from them is just enthusiasm love yeah. of the outdoors <laughs> uh, able to work with us yeah um, <laughs> which is really easy um, yeah. Yeah, just a good enthusiasm, but we have a really lovely bunch already, yeah. um, but we always welcome more. Yeah. And here's Sophie again, talking about one of the park's special habitats. So, first question for this is, wet woodland, not a common habitat, uh, could you describe it for us? So, wet woodland usually forms in lowland areas, often on um, floodplains and along riverbanks. Um, it's one of the rarest habitats in the UK, um, so it gets a lot of specialist uh, plant life, things like mosses, lichens, which are adapted to the microclimate, lots of humidity, um, dominated by things like alder, ash, willow, because those kinds of trees are really adapted to extracting oxygen from saturated soils. Let's talk about birds for a minute because it's really important. Uh, there are indigenous ones who will find this great. What about the visitors that uh, that use this as a stopping off place? Yeah, so it attracts a lot of attention because it's a little bit different in character. There's lots of um, gnarly looking trees. Obviously, some of the trees are completely submerged in water, so a lot of people um, do see it as a bit of a specialist habitat. But lots of birds will use it as well because it's full of insect life, which again, like the, the microclimate, um, specialist birds like willow tit in particular, um, which is the UK's fastest declining resident bird, um, which we are working on a project for in this area. How hard is it to make this look like human beings haven't been here? Not that hard, actually. We do do a little bit of work, but often when you get wet woodland that has uh, species like crack willow, 
that naturally regenerates itself on a 50 year or so cycle anyway. Um, so wet woodland is one of the more low maintenance habitats that we need to look after, but we still do certain jobs like um, thinning trees out, making sure enough light can get into the woodland itself, which will develop um, ground flora and other species. But generally it, it will take care of itself. Sophie Pinder telling us all about that special habitat of wet woodland in the Dern Valley Park. Dern Valley Park is important because biodiversity is important and the opportunity the park gives for urban populations to understand their natural surrounding, breathe clean air and relax. Biodiversity ensures that ecosystems remain healthy and provide the fresh water insects to pollinate plants and trees and fertile soil we need in order to live. Biodiversity underpins all forms of life on earth. Since so many species are dependent on other species, if one is lost it stays lost forever and all the others suffer. That is why it's vital to create and protect habitats like those of the Dern Valley Park. Whatever their size, all projects matter. All can make a difference which builds into a bigger picture of global biodiversity and a sustainable environment. <laughs>